Well, I'm really, uh, I'm uh, really fortunate to be chairing this panel, which means nothing other than getting to introduce the luminaries that are here. Uh, I thought I'd take one and a half seconds of uh, your grace to say what a wonderful year this has been for the Frankel Institute. It's always a really wonderful occasion to bring so many great people together that this particular group has an extraordinary cohesion, an extraordinary uh, brilliance. Uh, I think we should all thank Ryan. I, I know on campus it's been a lovely thing to have you all here and very exciting. So without further ado, let me introduce the speakers. I'll introduce them all and then like Harvey, I'm going to sit down so I can enjoy the talks to, uh, I will come back up at the end to take, uh, to take questions, okay. to MC. Ryan Speech is Associate Professor in the Departments of Romance Languages and Literatures and Judaic <coughs> Studies at the University of Michigan and Head Fellow of this year's Frankel Institute on Sephardic Identities. His research interests include medieval polemic writings, by, polemical writings by Christians, Jews, and Muslims, and the history of multilingualism and translation in the medieval Mediterranean. He's the author of Conversion and Narrative, Reading and Religious Authority in Medieval Polemic by the University of Pol uh, uh, Pennsylvania Press 2013, which re received the 2015 La Coronica International Book Award for the best book in medieval Hispanic languages, literatures, and cultures and the edited volumes Medieval Exegesis and Religious Difference, Commentary, Conflict, and Community in the Premodern Mediterranean for <coughs> 2015, and Astrolabes in Medieval Cultures, co-edited with the great Charles Burnett, Josefina Rodriguez Arribas, C.K. Ackerman, Brill 2019. He has published numerous articles on conversion and polemical literatures in late medieval Iberia, and he has also edited special issues of La Coronica, the Journal of Medieval Iberian Studies. He is also currently the editor-in-chief of the journal Medieval Encounters. <coughs> Our second speaker would be Monica Colominas Aparicio. She obtained her PhD from the University of Amsterdam in 2016 under the direction of Gerard Wiegers, receiving the 2015-2016 dissertation award from the Amsterdam School of Historical Studies. Since 2016, she has been a postdoctoral research scholar at the department uh, at the Max Planck Institute uh, for the History of Science in Berlin and a core member of the Max Planck Inst Interinstitutional Project Convivencia, <coughs> Iberian to Global Dynamics, 500 to 1750. She held a teaching fellowship at the Cohn Institute for the History and Philosophy of Science and Ideas at the University of Tel Aviv, and she has recently been awarded a teaching fellowship at Bard College Berlin in Germany. Her work focuses on identity discourses of the Muslim minority communities living under Christian rule, the Mudejares, in their works on uh, in their works on religious polemics with Christians and Jews, written in Arabic and in Khamiado, that is Spanish and Arabic characters. Her book, The Religious Polemics of the Muslims of Late Medieval Iberia: Identity and Religious Authority in Mudejar Islam, appeared in uh, in 2018 from Brill. She also holds a diploma in classical guitar from the Conservatorium <laughs> of Amsterdam. All those accolades, and I think that was the one that impressed me the most. <laughs> that was amazing. Um, You're giving a concert later. Yeah. <laughs> Harvey Hames received his PhD under David Abulafia at Cambridge. He is professor of history at Ben Gurion University of the Negev in Israel, where he holds the David Berg and family chair in European history. At Ben Gurion, he has served as Dean of the Faculty of Humanities and Social Sciences, as well as the Director of the Center for the Study of Conversion and Interreligious Encounters, which he founded. Since August 2018, he is the Rector of the University. His research focuses on medieval history, with a particular interest in interreligious encounters, particularly between Christianity, Judaism, and Islam. He also works on religious conversion, interreligious polemics, mysticism, philosophy, apocalypticism, and magic. He is the author of over 40 articles and three books, as well as the editor of two books and two special journal issues. So I'll turn it over to you, Ryan. Thanks, Hussein, and thank you again to all of you uh, for being here. Um, and I'll begin with an apology for uh, just repeating myself. Since what I um, have here is something that I've not only presented to the fellows here, so many of you in the room already know what I'm going to say before I say it, um, 
it's also something I've presented uh, a few times recently elsewhere. So Harvey, even though he didn't hear me say it in front of the fellows, heard me say it elsewhere, since it's something I talked about in Paris. So I'm getting to this stage where, you know, uh, you can just bring me a blanket, put me in the corner, and I'll repeat myself um, and keep myself happy. But this is a story that has perplexed me, and so I keep repeating it because I can't quite get it right, or I keep trying to tell it correctly, and every time I make changes, uh, little ones. So maybe this version will get closer to what I want it to be, or maybe not. But we'll try getting closer, and I welcome your comments on this because it is something that I'm still trying to pin down exactly. Um, around 1322, uh, a recently converted Castilian Jew, formerly from Burgos, but now living in Valladolid, tells a curious story in Hebrew. He claims this took place in the 12th century under the reign of King Alfonso VIII. And uh, I've given you his quotations on the handout, which I'll read to you in English. Um, what he says is the following. It was not long ago that these Castilian Jews and most of the Jews of Spain were Sadducees and heretics, as the sage Abraham Ibn Ezra wrote in his commentary on the Torah. And so wrote Moses uh, of Leon in the letter he composed in order to contradict the Sadducees, which he said was in the year 4938 of creation, which would be 1138, uh, sorry, 1178 of the Christian era, common era, in which they converted they, the, the Sadducees to believe in the faith that they now have in the Talmud Babli, not by their own free will, but rather because of the uproar that there was between the Sadducees and the Pharisees in the town of Carrion. But the Sadducees were more powerful, and they did not light candles on the night before the Sabbath in all the town. And there were among the Pharisees three honored men who complained that the law was not being observed among the people. And they complained so much that one of them became zealous for God and lit candles publicly for the Sabbath. And that was not the custom of the Sadducees. I'll jump ahead. And there was a great outcry in the Jewish neighborhood because people thought he had violated the Sabbath. And the news of this arrived to the head rabbi of the Sadducees who lived in Burgos, and he ordered him to be arrested. And so the Sadducees and the Pharisees had to go to King Don Alfonso, and among the Pharisees there was one Jew, physician of the king, named Joseph ibn al fakar from Granada, and the king did what he wanted. So the king ordered all the Sadducees to turn to the law of the Pharisees, and so they all converted against their will to this Pharisee law which they now follow. By such accidents as these, Jews in each age turn from one belief to another, and they wander in exile like sheep without a shepherd, ever since they left the true shepherd. Now, of course, you know the author of this story, if you've heard me tell this story before, or heard me open my mouth ever, you know that the author of this story is the converted Jew, Abner, little Abner, uh, affectionately, <coughs> Abner of Burgos, who was known after his conversion to Christianity around 1320 as Alfonso, Alfonso de Valladolid. And after his conversion, he spent the remaining decades, about three decades of his life, writing anti-Jewish polemics in Hebrew, exclusively in Hebrew, which he directed to his former friends and colleagues. And so consider for a moment what that means. Here you have uh, a Jew who's educated uh, in rabbinical literature in Hebrew, who writes in Hebrew to other Jews who are reading Hebrew, writes exclusively about Jewish topics, thinks about rabbinical literature, Talmud, uh, Midrash, and Torah, doesn't know Latin or doesn't know it well, doesn't really write in Latin or other languages to his fellow Christians, but only to his former friends. Uh, and as, so he continues for the rest of his, his days. Where does he belong? Uh, this writer of Hebrew uh, who writes exclusively against uh, his former faith. He's proved to be a problem for scholars because he doesn't fit linguistically, culturally, uh, mentally. He seems to be very Jewish. And yet at the same time, uh, religiously, he's not. Or he's not, at least in any orthodox straightforward sort of way. So I won't weigh in exactly on what he is, but he's not normal. <laughs> Besides his Hebrew writing, he also uh, wrote at the behest of Blanca, 
who was granddaughter of King Alfonso X and was a nun at the convent in Burgos, Las Huelgas, he wrote a translation of some of his works, <coughs> many of his works, into Castilian. Um, which ones exactly, how many, it's hard to tell, but there are Castilian translations from the 14th century of all of these works, and they all are the same uh, in <coughs> rhetoric and style, so I attribute them all to him. We know for sure, at least, that the first ones were his. Abner's works now survive in a tangled miscellany, versions in many languages, in Hebrew, as well as in matching or closely matching Castilian translation, or sometimes in a little bit of both, some passages in one, some in the other, some overlapping, and also quoted in Latin, uh, including passages that otherwise don't survive. The story I've told you is taken from Abner's longest polemic, the Moritzedek, or Teacher of Righteousness, written in Hebrew just after his conversion around 1320, which you see in manuscript here. It survives only in this 14th century Castilian version, under the title Mostrador de Justicia. So he certainly did this version, uh, this manuscript. Um, whether he wrote this official manuscript, this actual manuscript, I don't know, but he did this version uh, undoubtedly. This text, which no longer survives in Hebrew, takes the form of a long dialogue between a teacher, a moré, and a rebel, a mored, and contains this story I've told you, but also offers insight into Abner's beliefs about the coming of the Messiah uh, and the beliefs of his contemporaries who answered him and countered him at every turn. The Sadducees of whom Abner speaks are, I presume, the Karaites, uh, the Jewish sect that flourished in the Islamic Middle East sometime starting in the 9th century in Iraq, teaching a strict sort of biblical fundamentalism that rejected all rabbinical insights and writings and tradition of oral Torah, including Talmud and Midrash. The Karaites were commonly called Sadducees in medieval Hebrew sources, including especially Ibn Daud, whom I'll get to in a, well, I'll get to in a second, uh, and they seem to have been or may have been, prominent in Islamic Al-Andalus in the 11th century. Again, I'm cautious and cagey because we don't know. We are stepping into the middle of a, of a firefight over what actually happened in history. Abner's story about the Karaites, however, is long after all of the history, coming to us in the 14th century uh, in one of various stories that seems to mimic earlier stories, but is in no way dependent exclusively on them. Abner's story thus raises a number of curious questions, some of which I'll be able to address here. What, first of all, is the historicity of the story that Abner tells, in which a Christian king entertains a request from Rabbinite Jews and agrees to issue a decree forcing Karaite Jews to give up their traditions and follow Rabbinite teaching? Can this, one must ask, be called a conversion, as Abner calls it? Even more importantly for our discussion than real history, uh, what does the story actually do in Abner's writing? What is the presence of this story able to tell us about his particular understanding of what was orthodox and what was not, about Karaism and Rabbinism in the 14th century, and what was the role of the Christian king in Jewish affairs in his day, that is, in early 14th century <coughs> medieval Castile? Uh, and finally, what does the mention of the story mean in the context of Abner's other ideas, his anti-Jewish argumentation and his public career in Castile between 1325 and 1345, and in particular, his sense of identity? Did he identify with the Christian story or the Christian king? Uh, did he identify in some way with the Karaites? Did he identify with someone else? Um, and did it match how he was identified by others? There are many questions, but in my remarks to follow, I will attempt to answer just a few of these, saying something along the lines of what follows. That Abner's story ought to be called a conversion narrative, like other conversion stories in medieval polemical writing, insofar uh, as it represents a sort of uh, standard plot element of conflict, crisis, and resolution through conversion, but also because of the vocabulary he uses. Here, using the word in Castilian, tornar and tornarse, in crafting his narrative, which is his rendering of uh, the biblical or Hebrew words, something along the lines of shuv or tuva, or something related to turning and returning. We're not exactly sure what it might have said in Hebrew, but we can pretty much guess. And the vocabulary is not particularly uh, extraordinary. 
And we can see that this story is part of his overall agenda, which I would call missionizing in his context, that is reaching out to other people to try to convert them through coercion and argument. An agenda that he continued in his petitions to the king in his day, who did in his day interfere in Jewish affairs in Castile, just like happened in his story. So Abner's use of this strange story uh, from long before his day of a forced, quote unquote, conversion, quote unquote, within the Jewish community between Jews, that is of Jews forcing Jews to do something, or of Jews having the king force Jews to do something, uh, has really more to do with his life and his argumentation than it does with any history we can construct or attempt to construct about Karaites. It can be read anyway as a tactic in his writing for inspiring doubt in his readers, all Jews <coughs> reading in Hebrew, uh, in order to try to bring about their conversion. And so the question is why? What kind of inspiration could this story offer? I think, on the one hand, Abner represents force and coercive, coercive power as a natural aspect of Iberian Jewish society, in a way providing a logical context in which to develop and proffer his own anti-Jewish polemical writing, and in a way to threaten readers uh, with the prospect of action against them by the crown. This happened before, this could happen again. Jews forcing Jews, Jews getting Christians to force Jews. We know that there's also a cloud hanging over uh, all of this, which is 70 years after the fact of his conversion and career uh, came the mass forced conversions of 1391. So, is it correct, as some historians like Yitzhak Baer have argued, that Abner was the seed of all that would come to pass in 1391 when thousands of Jews were killed and many others converted against their will? Is it true, as Baer says, that he was the seed of the rack and ruin that was to befall the Jews of the peninsula? Or not? Is it just a coincidence that he's talking about stories of forced conversion and that forced conversion did come to pass in his world? Um, I'll uh, hold the suspense and let you guess what I'm going to say until the end. But I will say that in his world, although he opposes forced conversion on the whole, and writes extensively and explicitly about it, and I'll come to that in a moment, he argues that conversion in this way is not part of God's plan for the Jews. Ultimately, as I'll show, because they don't deserve it. This would be too much of a salvation for them, and he doesn't recommend it. He also suggests that Christian reading of the Talmud, in his way, is justified in order to bring about as many conversions as possible through argumentation. So before turning now to Abner's particular use of this story as a kind of uh, opinion on forced conversion in the context of his other polemical writing, let me pause a moment and establish the more um, materialist question, um, what later Christian philosophers uh, all the way into the modern period would call the Jewish question on the table. That is, what actually happened here? Did he know about Karaites? Did he really think about Karaites? Did he possess a Karaite manuscript or story? Where did he get his tale uh, if he didn't? So the real question is, was there a Karaite presence in Spain at all? The earliest origins of Karaism, as I've said, are in the ninth century in the Middle East, but they're obscure. And there are no surviving works written by Karaites from the Iberian Peninsula. In fact, historically speaking, there are no names of any Karaites in the Iberian Peninsula <coughs> except two. Uh, they are uh, Abu Altaras, or Atras, depending on how you look at it, and his wife, uh, Mu'allima, both mentioned by Ibn Daud and nowhere else. Abu Altaras is credited by the 12th century writer Ibn Daud as being the founder of the Karaites of the Peninsula, having gone to the Holy Land and quote unquote, met with the wicked Karaite Sheikh Abul Faraj, who seduced him into heresy. Abu al-Taras then, quote, composed a work animated by seduction and perversion, which he introduced into Castile and led many astray. And when Abu al-Taras passed on to hell, he was survived by his accursed wife, whom his adherents used to address as Walim. That's all we have, as far as names go. Yet a handful of other Karaite books are alluded to, by 
12th century Iberian Jewish authors, including all of the big guns, Moses ibn Ezra, Judah Halevi, Abraham ibn Ezra, Joseph ibn Sadiq, Maimonides, and ibn Daud. So, maybe they did exist. References to Karaites also appear in the writing of non-Jewish writers of the 11th century, or at least something we equate with Karaism. Um, that would be Ananites, followers of Anan ben David. Um, references by Cordoba ben, uh, Muslim author Ibn Hazm. He, as I say, calls them Ananites, followers of Anan ben David, who was considered by many in the Middle Ages to be a founder of Karaism. So, maybe they do exist. We can infer from these references that at least news of the Karaite movement had spread to the Iberian Peninsula by the 11th century, and that Karaism developed a real presence in Castile uh, in such cities as Burgos, Toledo, Carrion, halfway between Burgos and Leon. At least the legend of a presence developed in those cities, one that was notable, notable enough to be told and retold and used as the backdrop for a tale of persecution. So. None of it is proof that they actually were there, but it's certainly proof that they were on the minds of the people who were there. So the reason Abner on the first, in the first place uses this story is because it would resonate with his readers. But it tells us nothing about the true history of Karaites in the peninsula, I don't think. Now, at the same time, this hasn't deterred eager scholars for over a century now, various scholars have sought to demonstrate a possible influence of Karaism on Abner's anti-Jewish polemics, as well as many other things uh, on his polemics, precisely because of what that might imply about the survival of some Karaism or Karaite thought or Karaite works well beyond their established historical record. Uh, that is, people stop complaining about them sometime uh, at the end of the 12th century, it seems, or early 13th, and yet here's Abner in romance in the 14th century, talking about them as if he just met them yesterday. Still, no smoking gun has been found to establish any direct knowledge of any Karaite works on Abner's part, despite very, very noble attempts by Daniel Lasker. Um, but Daniel has, and others, have concluded that it simply is not credible. And in fact, Lasker says, it's hard to credit the idea that the anti-Talmudic arguments of Abner of Burgos would actually derive from sources because Abner was too erudite to need such sources. That's one way to think of it. Or we could just say we don't have any books, there's no evidence. Either way, what we do have is a story. So where does he get his story? Perhaps that'll help lead us in a different direction. One possible source of the legend is his writing uh, is the writing of Joseph ben Todros, who was the son of Kabbalist Todros ben Joseph Halevi, Abu Lafia, uh, the courtier in uh, the court of Alfonso X. Not to be confused with uh, his father, I think it is, Todros ben Joseph Abu Lafia. Correct me, Ross, if I'm getting these Josephs and Todroses backwards. Um, that is his father, who was the author of, uh, or his better known uncle, Todros ben Judah Abu Lafia, who was the well known poet in Alfonso's court. Todros ben Joseph, no, sorry, Todros ben <laughs> Judah is the author of the famous lines, uh, <coughs> one should love an Arab girl even if she's not beautiful or pure, but stay away from a Christian girl even if she's as radiant as the sun. Uh, famous indeed. But no, we're not speaking about him, although it would be fun. I'm speaking about Todros ben Joseph and his son, Joseph ben Todros. In a letter written sometime, sometime after 1221 about the controversy surrounding Maimonides' works, Joseph ben Todros boasted about his own father, Todros ben Joseph's role in opposing the Karaites of Castile. So early 13th century discussions of Karaites. He says that his father sought to, quote, remove from our provinces the abominations of the heretics until he succeeded in destroying their fortresses and pulled down to earth their glory. And there was not on the day of God's wrath a remnant when he executed judgment upon them and upon their books. And this is included on your sheet, which I will also put up here briefly. So it seems that he's referring to a similar, if not identical, story about persecution of the Karaites uh, and their suppression <coughs> sometime in the 12th century or early 13th. But this doesn't match Abner's narrative, really. 
Um, the details are different, the people are different, the outcome is different. Another possible source for Abner's story, more likely in fact, is the Hebrew history, Sefer HaKabalah, a book of tradition by Abraham ibn Daoud, a work that Ab Abner himself refers to and quotes some 15 times in the Mohed Tzedek, explicitly by name, that is. Ibn Daoud states that Joseph, uh, sorry, Judah ben Joseph ibn Ezra had been appointed tax collector by Alfonso the seventh of Castile, so not the eighth, not the tenth. Alfonso the seventh put him in charge of Calatrava, and Ibn Daoud says that Joseph, quote, then requested for the king to forbid the heretics to open their mouths throughout the land of Castile, and the king commanded that this be done. Accordingly, the heretics were suppressed and have not been able to raise their heads any longer. Indeed, they are dwindling steadily. This too presents an interesting parallel, but not an exact match with Abner's story. We have another different king, a different Alfonso, a different year, and a different outcome again. But there's an interesting parallel, and in particular, most striking to me, is the peculiar use of terms like not exactly Karaite uh, and Rabbanite, but Samaritan and Kuthian, which seem to mirror a similar usage uh, in Abner's writing as well. That is, uh, they don't call them Karites, Rabbanites, uh, or other things. They speak of um, Samaritans, Pharisees, uh, and Sadducees. Ibn Daoud could not be the main source, however, any more than Joseph ibn Todros, because the details of their stories don't match, and in any case, uh, the, the use of vocabulary, who's a Sadducee, who's a Kuthian, and who's a heretic, are slightly different. And the fact that Abner quotes other things perfectly directly and accurately also suggests that he wouldn't choose to distort this when citing Ibn Daoud perfectly clearly elsewhere. If we compare the facts in these different narratives, to be clear, it seems that Abner and Ibn Daoud are talking about two different events. Ibn Daoud is writing approximately 1160 or 61 and is speaking of Judah ben Joseph ibn Ezra and Alfonso VII, which would have been approximately 1146 whereas Abner is speaking of Joseph ibn al-Fakar and Alfonso VIII and describes events that allegedly took place in 1178, some 17 years after uh, Ibn Daud wrote. But more importantly for our purposes, the descriptions that these authors give are entirely different, and this is what interests me the most, which is that neither Joseph ben Todros nor Ibn Daud use the word turn or convert. Instead, they talk about suppression or destruction or some other form of uh, losing, but not being forced to turn. So that's what I'd like to focus on. Uh, I could talk extensively about what Abner actually seems to say that resembles distantly Karaite thinking and writing, um, but I don't think that that'll be productive, so I'll leave that for a question and answer because I, it's, it's technical and it's also speculative. But we can weigh all of the evidence about these details and simply conclude that Abner knew nothing of the existence of real Karaites uh, and knew very little about their basic beliefs, as far as I can tell. Um, but there's certainly no evidence of direct first-hand familiarity and certainly no quotations or references to actual Karaite works. So the more interesting question is why he tells the story and why he uses the words he does to tell it. The short answer is, of course, that the story serves as argument against the reliability of rabbinical tradition as it existed in Castile in the 14th century. And this criticism further serves his overall Christian polemical appeal to have everyone, Christians and Jews, read the Talmud more deeply in search of what he believes is its message. That is, that the early rabbis, the Tanaim and Amoraim, actually taught about Jesus as the Messiah. The changes in rabbinical teaching that were implemented by rabbis after the early rabbis, rabbis of his own day, have delegitimized Judaism and led to what we see today. What Abner perceived as a lack of internal coherence within Jewish belief and practice bothered him very much, and he dedicates his attention repeatedly to this problem of Jewish diversification of thought, of the breakdown of pure Talmudic tradition and the loss of a strict <coughs> biblical fundamentalism. He speaks about this elsewhere without mentioning Karaites or Sadducees or any of these stories, 
Uh, and so his references to the Karaites seem to serve as proof that medieval Jews are fragmented and chaotic in their community and are, as he says, desperate in their need of a single compelling teacher to make sense of their belief. And in fact, in one section he gives a list of some 45 different sects and heresies and schisms within the Jewish community. Um, everything from uh, believing in divination using eggs to the tying of knots to uh, something that looks like Kabbalistic thought uh, to Sadducees, Pharisees, Kufians, and many others. But the language that Abner uses to describe the scene of these particular heretics is unique in the surviving documentation and in Abner's writing because it speaks of this conversion, again I say tornarse, as forced. The Karaites were not only made, uh, were not only made Rabbinites in order to keep silent, as Ibn Dawood says. Not only did they witness their fortresses destroyed, as Joseph says, but they were made to turn, to convert to the law of the rabbinical majority. And this translation of lashuv or uh, some other verb relating to, related to turning suggests what Abner has on his mind. The same word he uses elsewhere to talk about conversion, and which is a common word for conversion in Castilian. The Karaites, moreover, are converted against their will, a pesar de ellos, as it says. That is, against uh, their better judgment or in despite, of, despite themselves. Such language here leaves no ambiguity to what he is intending. And in fact, the version of this passage, uh, survive, there is a version of this passage that survives in Latin in a quote from the 15th century within the vast polemical anthology Fortalitium Fidei uh, of Alonso de Espina. And here, there's no ambiguity about how it was read, either. Espina says, Conversi sunt, non voluntarie sed violenter. They were converted not by their own free will, not by, but not by will, but violently. The explicit claim that Rabbinites forced Karaites to convert opens the door to Abner's own argument that Jews suffer this all the time. They're made to turn and convert, and it's happened over and over again even at the hands of their own Jewish brethren. And thus they might be made to turn again now. As he says, quote, They turned against their will and by such accidents as these Jews turn in every age from one belief to another. In a way it seems to present a sort of precedent to future Jewish conversions to Christianity under coercion. But does it? Does it then mean that Abner unequivocally supported the forced conversion of Jews to Christianity and this is a separate, more complicated question. But the small and short answer is a cautious, I don't think so. Because Abner distinguished between the role of Karaites and Rabbinites in God's salvific plan. Because forced conversion, in his eyes, is a way to do away with a people, not to create a new faith. It makes sense that God should use it as a way to destroy the Karaites, not to bring them to the truth. Abner speaks about conversion in multiple ways, and specifically speaks about forced conversion in multiple ways. And I'd like to suggest a few of these, although we can't get deeply into them, I can talk more about them afterwards. He speaks in almost a contradictory way about forced conversion in pastoral terms, philosophical terms, theological, and social. Suggesting on the one hand, in a pastoral sense, there is no force. One must appeal to the Jews and convert them with arguments. In a social sense, they can be coerced through social pressure. That is, asking the king to weigh in and offer laws that uh, put pressure on them and make it more convenient to convert. Or even, as he says, uh, to ask the king to force them to turn directly. In a philosophical sense, however, it's more complicated because Abner was a proponent of determinism, strict determinism, in which he argued again and again that everything was predetermined to happen. And thus, everything, in a way, he says, is forced, whether or not we think we're choosing. And he, his determinism is a bit peculiar. It's what's called compatibilism, which uh, tries to reconcile pure determinism with a sense of free will basically arguing that everyone has the experience of free will because that's what God wants, but, and so God can judge people, but that they actually don't have true free will in a cosmic sense. 
And those two things can be compatible because from our experience, we think we're doing what we need to do and can therefore be judged as just or unjust on that account. Um, so philosophically, he believes very strongly that all things are forced anyway, so it doesn't matter. But theologically, and this is the most important of the four, he would argue that forced conversion goes against God's plan for the Jews, which is not to have them convert now, certainly not in mass, but to have them wait and convert at the end of time. Partly as a punishment to them, because they don't deserve to be converted yet, and partly because it's not time to end history yet. Uh, and this is the standard marker for the end of time. So I can't get fully into those, but I wanted to suggest them in order to put in context what I'm going to say about uh, his relationship to 1391, the forced conversions that took place after his death by some 25 years, and that um, for which he's actually uh, often blamed as kind of uh, being the original source or initiator, at least by some historians. But a close reading of his comments show that he advocated first for argumentation, if we have to put these in order, and if this failed, the use of social pressure to help it along through taxes, uh, through laws, and other forms. And ultimately, uh, that one can threaten them with the theological ideal, but that mass forced conversion would simply be ineffective and go against the ultimate plan for God's will. Jews have a role to play in their disbelief in pure Augustinian fashion, although he doesn't quote Augustine on this. He says, If the Jews had tribulations that were bad enough or strong enough so that they had to convert to the law of the Christians or the Moors, or such that they were wiped out from the world, then those evils, which they have, would devolve by nature onto Christians and Moors. It's necessary that God keeps the Jews in the world, like he keeps devils, so they can be arms of his wrath and messengers of his anger in order to make bad Christians and Moors, who deserve it, trip and fall into punishment. See now, he says, how great and marvelous are the works of God, who chose the people of Israel from among the nations for his service both in substance and in accident. And he specifically says, it's, it's as if the Jews provide a sort of filter or screen for Christians and Muslims, preventing all of the bad things in the world from falling directly upon them. They're quite useful, not only as witnesses to error, which is the Augustinian notion, but also as actually a sort of a filter that keeps bad, bad things out of the world and concentrates it in one place. And in fact, uh, he, prevent, he, he provides a really interesting metaphor, which I uh, won't read to you because it's very long, but I've never seen it anywhere else, which is to suggest that Jews are like organs that filter the blood. Uh, they are uh, the organs that keep the body running by keeping it clean. And if they didn't exist, then all of the bad things of the body would be spread throughout and the body would die. And therefore, they're necessary for the social body as Jews because they collect all of uh, the bad things that would otherwise poison the social body. And so he specifically compares Jews to these organs, the spleen, the colon, the liver, and others. So, based on these strong metaphors, we can understand that he doesn't recommend things like 1391 under any circumstances because it would bring the destruction of all the social network. But one can try and on an individual level convince people with argumentation. As he says, quote, it's necessary to proceed against the Jew gently and to move him from wrong through reasoning, little by little, as is appropriate for human nature. It's necessary to convince him and here, he seems to be repeating the standard arguments of someone like Gregory the Great, arguing that Jews should be converted through blandishments and not through coercive arguments. But Abner's story about the forced conversion, the forced turning of the Karaites at the hand or instigation of other Jews is also in keeping with his general support for strong social power in pressuring Jews, I would say coercing Jews, to convert in his own day. In his story, two Jewish groups go to the Christian king and one, uh, and they go to the Christian king to talk about something internal to Jewish life, not to go talk about uh, taxes or uh, the neighborhood or the synagogue or the building or some other thing about who marches first in the parade. They go to talk to the king about how to celebrate the Sabbath. And when they can't agree, one group 
convinces the king to force the other group to celebrate the Sabbath in a certain way and forces all of them to accept oral Torah against their will. In itself, it's quite striking and weird, but when we put it in the context of his own life, it's even stranger. A decade or so after the Moritz Tzedek was written and the story of the Karaites was told, Abner himself began a public campaign in Castile against the Jewish use of the prayer, the blessing for the heretics, the Birkat Haminim, which he said uh, directly insults Christian, uh, Christians and uh, Christian practice. And in 1336, he successfully petitioned King Alfonso XI, yet another Alfonso, to ban the prayer in Castile, thus bringing about in his own day an event somehow redolent of the use of royal intervention in internal Jewish affairs. Not in this case about how to celebrate the Sabbath, but certainly how to pray. What prayers were allowed inside uh, Jewish mm, daily life uh, in the synagogue and the Christian king decides how Jews and what Jews can pray at the hand of, I won't say another Jew, but another uh, fellow member or former member of the Jewish community. Broadly speaking, Abner held in the same way that Jewish belief, like the Talmud and all of its traditions of oral Torah, had somehow devolved, like the Torah itself, onto the Christians and become the ballywick of Christian thinking because Christians had become the true Israel. So this is not surprising, but what it means is not that they reject oral Torah, but embrace it. And here he mm, anticipates the arguments of another important convert from Burgos, Paul of Burgos, or Solomon Halevi, who himself argues the same thing uh, in the beginning or early part of the 15th century, that the Talmud is actually a source for Christians to learn about their own tradition not simply to be rejected and attacked, but actually to be used as a prediction for the coming of the Messiah and as an education for how to read the Torah. Post-biblical literature naturally could be brought to bear on Christian belief and history, and thus Talmud could naturally be read as a proof of Christian truth. But the final implications here are that Rabbinite Jews themselves, with their own forced conversion of Karaites, had laid the foundations in the 12th century for the full history of the Christian appropriation of rabbinical literature as a pro-Christian authority in the 13th and 14th, whether as the Talmud in Latin uh, or all the way uh, into the 14th century in Abner's works. Um, and strangely, and in this I think Ross is right, what uh, he suggested earlier, that Abner identifies with the Karaites even though he's rejecting them. That is, he identifies with them as fellow critics of rabbinite tradition uh, in the old way, and believes that things need to be understood at least in a new way, if not completely differently uh, than the Jews are offering. So, our banal historiographical question, did the Rabbinites really force the Karaites to, of Spain to convert? Did Abner know about such events through reliable sources? It's like the story of the Goy's teeth, you know, in A Serious Man. What happened to the Goy? Who cares? This is not the question. Ultimately, Abner's presentation reminds us that conversion in documents like these is less to be understood as dealing with history in itself rather than uh, dealing with stories to be told. That we must not see these questions as a series of actions or events to be reconstructed, like a sort of reconstruction of a delicate spider web, but as a cr carefully crafted narrative meant to be read and explicated through exegesis and critical reading. Historians must tread delicately when dealing with things like conversion, and here I'm really repeating myself. Whether we're forced or not, we must avoid the historiographical Scylla and Charybdis of reading conversion in either the, with the eyes of a preacher who wants to parrot the narratives of historiography and hagiography as if they were real factual histories, but also avoid reading them like an inquisitor who evaluates hagiographies in terms of their stories of alleged sincerity and inner faith or lack thereof. If we can avoid these two roles in our reading, our methodology uh, then doesn't have to run aground on these questions of facts and can instead steer towards the message. As Webb Keen points out, quote, if conversion has historical implications, then history has moral implications, unquote. 
In this light, Abner's views on forced conversion seem to offer us a cautionary tale, not only about what might happen to the Jews if they don't read the Talmud correctly, but also against reading polemical writing teleologically through the lens of later events, violence and catastrophe, or reading any history teleologically. In this case, the polemics of the 12th to the 14th centuries do not necessarily, or not at all, lead to the pogroms of 1391 in any necessary way, but they can help explain them in retrospection. So we would do well to remember, as Abner's own views on coercion suggest, that forced conversion and forced reading in any context implies the breakdown of theological ideals more than it implies the affirmation of logical consequences or spiritual fulfillment. Thank you. Good afternoon. It is a pleasure to be here today and to have the opportunity to present my ongoing research at the Frankel Institute. This is a little bit challenging, not only because I still did not present to the seminar as the only one who didn't yet, but also because all of you are more knowledgeable than I on, on Jews and on Judaism and on the Iberian Peninsula. So. Um, much of the academic efforts to study the identity of Jews of Iberian origin and their descendants have mainly focused on the emic perspectives of the members of their communities. This is the case with the notions of exceptionalism that foreground the noble ancestry, excellent aesthetic skills, and unprecedented intellectual achievements of native-born Jews in Sephardi, that you know it's the well-known uh, biblical reference generally identified with the Iberian Peninsula. In this presentation, I will instead consider the understandings of Jews' exceptionalism by non-Jews, in particular by Peninsular Muslims in anti-Jewish polemics. Adam Bieber has partly addressed the question in his examination of narratives about the origins of Iberian Jews in Christi Christian humanist historiographies. One of these narratives alludes to a group of Jews from Jerusalem that were part of the legions of the Assyrian king Nebuchadnezzar. These Jews, it is claimed, came to the peninsula and brought with them a copy of the Torah. The copy was thus spared from destruction during the Jews' captivity, and it was claimed to be God's original revelation. The earliest accounts of this legend are traced among Jews in Al-Andalus, and then the narrative entered the Christian territories and was transformed, I quote Beaver, from a figure of Jewish-Muslim polemic into the figure of Judeo-Christian interaction, negotiation, and filiation, unquote. Beaver's analysis shows how Nebuchadnezzar Jewish legions became part of a shared intellectual legacy of Jews, Christians, and Muslims. It does, however, not pay attention to the reception of Islamic and particularly Andalusian views regarding the origins of Jews in religious polemics by Muslims under Christian rule, Mudejars, and by those who were gradually forced to convert to Christianity and finally expelled from Spain, the Moriscos. In what follows, I aim to address this question by paying particular attention to how Muslim political, uh, political, polemical writings, <laughs> again Jews, dealt with notions of Jews' exceptionalism in the peninsula and what was the specific weight of these claims in the bulk of the arguments in these works, is, if any. The first observation is about identifications and about the identification of Sephardi with Al-Andalus or with the area of Muslim influence, which raises specific questions as we approach the modern age. On the one hand, Sephardi was not only Al-Andalus, but from the 14th century onwards and as late as the 16th century, it was also used for Castile. On the other hand, the various communities in the territories had different understandings of Al-Andalus. An example of this is provided by the case of the 14th century Jewish astronomer Jacob Corsono, or Corsino, 
famous for having work on the astrological tables commissioned by Pat Peter IV of Aragon, the Ceremonious. Corsono is called in the introduction of the astrological tables in Hebrew and Catalan, respectively, Jakub Corsino, Yehuda Nisefarat, and Maestre Jakub Corsono, Jueu de España. References that I quote Eduard Faliu obviously do not refer to any territory of the Catalan Aragonese crown, but to the place of origin of Corsino, that is, to Andalusia. Unquote. Interestingly, a Muslim close to Corsono's environment named Al Muhajiri referred to the Jew as his master and professor and dedicated a copy of Ptolemy's Almagest to him in 1381. Al Muhajiri works from an Islamic mindset. He calls King Pedro Sultan, and more relevant to our discussion, when he mentions the place of copy, uh, Saracusta, Saragossa, uh, he situates it in Al Andalus. Saragossa passed from Muslim to Christian uh, hands uh, about 200 years before, in 1180. Al Muhajiri's claim in the late 14th century draws attention because it shows how two contemporaries, two individuals who, who could have been colleagues, had disparate understandings of Al Andalus and Sephirat. Moreover, the example foregrounds that not only experience, in the present case, the living experiences of the two religious minorities in the Christian territories, but also tradition the use or the absence of an Islamic framework. The memory of experience and the memory of tradition is relevant to Sephardic or to any other identity. There are a good number of examples that serve to showcase processes of change in the passage from a Muslim to a Christian uh, system in the Iberian Peninsula, but I would like to take one that, in my view, embodies the idea of change in a peculiar way. Change with regard to Jews, especially conversos, but also change with regard to Muslims, with whom they are compared to. It gives us a rough idea of the exacerbation of the Christian thought at the end of the late Middle Ages regarding the question of origins, which is a subject that would become increasingly significant in the territories, and we shall see, would have an impact on the relationships between the two minorities. The Alboraike, a horse whose name reminds us uh, of the name of the horse that Muhammad took to ascend to the heavens, al Burak, epitomizes that degeneration of the converted Jews are converses. He is the main character of a controversial pamphlet against these groups in Castile that bears the same name and it's likely to be dated in the 15th century. The deformities of this fantastic horse that stands for the Jews and Judaism are evident in the image before you. So you can see all these differences with a normal horse. Um, I want to pay attention, though, to what the pamphlet says about the connection between the stirrups of the Alboraike and the lineages of the Jewish conversos. I quote, the stirrups are made of many metals. That is because the Alboraicos, that is to say the conversos, are made of many metals, not only because of conversion, but the conclusion that they are like metal, of which the stirrups of the Alboraike are made, is because the Jews of Jerusalem are also of metal, since they all come from the captivity of Jerusalem to Babylon and married women from all the nations of the Gentiles, and brought within their nation many metals from old. They are infinitely alloyed, even more so after other mixtures with Mahomedan Gentiles occurred." Unquote. Contemporary Jewish conversos, even before conversion, are thought to be a mishmash. They are an alloy, it seems to be the meaning of metals. We must bear in mind that in those days, the alloy was probably one of the few materials with a homogeneous external appearance that could conceal its intrinsic nature made of different primary elements. The stirrups, and by analogy also the conversos themselves and their Jewish forefathers, are made of metallic alloy, something that is telling, if one bears in mind, that the stirrup is precisely the part of the horse's saddle that allows the reader to climb um, on the horse's back and to become a knight. The Alboraica thus serves to advance the polemical Christian figure of thought about conversos 
namely that they are alloyed, that their alloyed nature prevents them from being knights, that is from accessing high level positions in society, including nobility. Their Ascendance is an alloy, or metallis, a mixture that is the result of the continuous intermixing of Jews with non-Jewish nations. But not only, as we can read in the full, full version of this passage that I do not provide here, also the many heresies that exist within their communities make them alloyed, or metalados, with regards to theology. Mm. Nobility, and the very possibility to achieve it, seems to be an important subject of controversy in the Alboraica, and so is it in Nebuchadnezzar's tale about the origins of the Iberian Jews. As Weber notes, the appearance of the tale in Al-Andalus was a reaction to the well-known Muslim accusation of Tahrif, or the claim that Jews and Christians had altered God's revelation uh, to mankind. But the plot, in fact, moves the focus from textual critique to the question of excellence linked to origins. Mudejar and Morisco anti-Jewish polemics make no use of Nebuchadnezzar Jewish legions, but the authors devote much <coughs> attention to the dispute about origins, nobility, and lineage. The Ta'yit al-Mila, the fortification of the faith, is the lengthiest Muslim anti-Jewish treatise in the peninsula, including the work by Ibn Hazm, and was likely composed in the Christian territories. The oldest known Arabic copy was composed in the city of Huesca, Aragon, in 1361, but the work had a wider circulation, and we know of other Arabic copies and, and also of its adaptation into al um, The first section is uh, entirely devoted to a certain central point of contention with Judaism, and probably you know, the uh, Jewish argument of the preeminence of the lineage of Isaac over that of Ismail. <coughs> Isaac is much more noble because the Jews claim he is born from the marriage of Abraham with his legitimate wife, Sarah, whereas Ismail was born from the relation that Abraham had with his concubine, Hagar. The Muslims' rebuttal to this emphasizes preeminence based on merit before God and not on descent. God, they claim, had in truth spoke to Abraham and blessed Ismail when he said that 12 nobles, Shurafa, will be begotten by him and I will make of him a great nation, unquote. Here, Shurafa, the plural of Sharif, bears the meaning of the eminent, the descendant of noble ancestry. The significance of the offspring of Abraham as a polemical mo motif needs to be understood against broader articulations of nobility in the period that can be examined from a, from a tri triple perspective of continuity, change, and tension. Claims about novel origins serve for the internal social differentiation of Muslim communities in the Christian territories until a late date. For example, in the 16th century, we have the Castilian Morisco, known as the Mancebo de Arevalo, who paid service, and I quote, uh, to a committee of the nobility of this kingdom of Aragon, meaning, of course, the Muslim nobility, unquote. Besides, lineage could facilitate the integration of converts into Christian structures. Morisco aristocratic families, particularly those from the kingdom of Granada, achieved the status of chivalry, Hidalguia, either by proving a conversion before the conquest of the kingdom or on account of their descendants from noble Muslim lineage when this could be put together with service to the crown. The Venegas family, for example, is a well-known case. Change in the Christian territories needs to consider that Muslims and Jews, the elite, um, had their own criteria of distinction uh, and they came into contact with the richest Christians of the time and, and the king and became part of a system that was governed by different criteria and was also subject to change. For example, the idea of nobility based on the sole criterion of lineage of blood was increasingly challenged by the criterion of nobility achieved by merit. Christian sources portrayed Muslims of noble rank through Christian imagery and language. And a case in point is the 13th century Muslim military nobility in Valencia. And on occasion, Muslims from Al-Andalus adopt the same clothes and armor as the Christian knights. 
Jews who held high positions, such as physicians, uh, were granted the same legal status uh, of the highest nobility of the kingdom and were occasionally designed, des designated with, and I quote uh, there, the florid Arabic titles usually reserved for prelates and knights, an indication of the esteem in which they were held, unquote. It seems, uh, from the study of Eric Klein, that the Nassim were not necessarily Davidic descendants and they were neither an aristocracy or nobility in the sense of a group with an internal cohesion. They were rather distinguished individuals who belonged to the urban elites and to, to a certain extent were similar and in competition with the Christian Pravi hominis and were connected to the community leadership but not, they were not the only ones in holding authority. I do not know whether the title of Sharif underwent similar transformations in the Christian territories or fully maintained its genealogical meaning. The emergence of this new elite provoked tensions and was challenged from within the communities. Nachmanides compared these Jewish novels to Ismailites. On the other hand, we know that uh, Muslim nobility in Aragon had disappeared already in the 14th century. Um, however, we have a strong Mudejar elite, an important Mudejar family such as the Belbis and the Sharafis, who had close connections to the court and extended networks in Aragon and Castile. Wealthy Mudejars engaged in intra-community struggles with other families and with the Mudejars middle class. Uh, they were part of these networks of power and collaborated with the Christians and got from them privileges that lasted for uh, generations. Particularly from the late 14th century onwards, converted Muslims and Jews met the increasing opposition of a urban nobility that came from, from abroad, and more generally, Christians worried about losing their own privileges in front of the minorities. They raised the question as to whether the newly baptized Christians uh, of noble origin had the right uh, to maintain their former status. Some regulations of the Cortes of Madrigal in 1476 show the Christians' anxiety provoked by Jews and Muslims whose outward appearance made them indistinguishable from Christian nobles. And here we have an example of one of the stipulations and we read both Jews and Muslims walk dressed in fine clothes, tailored in such a way that it is impossible to know if Jews are Jews, or if they are clerics, or lawyers of great status or authority, or if Moors are Moors, or Gentile men of the palace. And they wear silver and gold in the chairs, the spurs, the braces, the stirrups, and in the belts and swords." Unquote. This being said, it should be known that the two religious minorities of Mudejars and, and, and Jews show different degrees of prosperity and integration into the court, an imbalance that inevitably led to competition. Paradoxically, a scheme that places offspring at the center, like the one of Abraham, turned into a powerful mechanism by which the Mudejars and Moriscos could subvert the criterions of nobility given, given by bloodline and foster criteria of social advancement before the Christians, but also before the Jews. The offspring of Abraham is in fact only a tiny part of a more complex discourse about nobility that is well explained by looking first at the work of a convert of Judaism, Alonso of Cartagena, he was uh, the son of the famous converso Pablo de Santa Maria, of which uh, Brian just talked, um, and his contemporary of one of the copies of the Tayyid that was bound together with another important work of polemics against Jews and Christians called Kitab al Mujabala, Ma'al Yahudu al Nasara, or the book called Disputation with the Jews and the Christians. The Kitapa Mujadala was copied in 45 in Pedrola, Aragon, and the author relied, among others, on the work of a Qadi, a judge, from the already mentioned family of the Sharafis, who mo most likely needs to be identified with the physician of Peter IV of Aragon, and who had house properties in Castile, in Alcalá de Henares, province of Toledo. Cartagena penned his defense of the conversos 
uh, in defense of the Christ Christian unity in the wake of the attacks against the conversos in Toledo in 1449. In it, he distinguishes between Jews of flesh and blood and biblical Jews. He refers to three types of nobility. Civil nobility, that is in parallel link to lineage, theological and natural nobility, that is nobility by virtue, and claims that, I quote, the biblical Jews were distinguished by all three classes in the priesthood, kings and judges and other heroes, unquote. The Jews are not condemned, nor are they in a condition of servitude because of their lineage, but because of the incapacity the Jews of uh, flesh and blood have to accept Christ as the, as the Messiah, as the, I quote, the true eternal King Christ, unquote. In the reminder of my presentation, I will discuss one example that exposes the connection between lineage, theology, and virtue in nobility in Muslim polemical thought in the term just exposed. It comes from the Kitab al-Mujadala, so, so from this work who was produced in the environment of the king, and where is, uh, mention is made to the Jews and their views on predestination. Jews, the Muslim polemicist argues, claim that all sufferings and calamities happen to people because of their parents and grandparents. He takes two examples, the Muslim polemicist, of kings from Israel to explain that the reason for divine punishment has nothing to do with offspring or blood lineage. Basically, we have here two parents, Solomon and David, who have seriously offended God and God has decided to punish them through their children, Rehoboam and Absalom, respectively. This seems to, this seems to sustain, indeed, uh, the idea that suffering is transmitted from father uh, to son, and in addition, it brings into question God's justice and mercy towards mankind. What the author of the Kitab al-Mujadal strives to demonstrate is that Rehoboam and Absalom are, in fact, being punished for their own sins. God's decree, no doubt, is fulfilled, but retaliation follows a vertical pattern connecting God to man and not a triangular one, that is, one that includes orig horizontal link uh, through kingship. The sin of Solomon was to allow his wives to bow down and worship idols. God announces that he will not punish Solomon for consideration and benevolence towards his father, David. It will be Solomon's son, Rehoboam, who will lose the control over the tribes. This is a well-known story. Um, the Muslim author of the Kitab al-Mujadala contends, however, that the definitive reason why Rehoboam lost the control of the tribes was because at the moment when the tribe leaders approached him to negotiate their mutual relations, Rehoboam disregarded the wise advice of the elders of the community. As a consequence, Solomon's captain, Jeroboam, took the control of all the tribes except of one. The establishment of two kingdoms is the reason why God destroyed Israel. In the second example, King David took illegitimate, illegitimately the wife of his captain, Uriah, and God anticipates that the sons of his loins will act in the same way with him as punishment. And true, David's son Absalom fornicates with his father's slaves. But we read in the Kitab al-Mujadala, he behaves in this way following the advice of Ahitophel in the text Josaphat, a Canaanite, a Faris of the host. Josaphat wants to prevent at all costs the reconciliation between Absalom and David because he fears that this can bring loss to the Canaanites like him. Punishment again follows the divine will, but importantly, it is actualized due to man's actions, or the albedrio, a topic about which he claims the Jews have written some books. Here, the idea is that suffering, in particular the suffering that comes from the offense against God, is not hereditary. What follows from this is that there is a rupture between generations. That is to say that each generation starts anew. The ideas of the converso Alonso de Cartagena seem to develop along similar lines in his use of the concept of neophyte applied to, I quote, every generation of Christians, unquote. Such argument allows him to vindicate that those who have recently become part of the Christian community 
through baptism can get rid of their genealogical past and theological nobility, nobility of Jews is restored once they convert to Christianity and thanks to conversion. What he calls the latent nobility. So this latent nobility is revived at the moment you convert and, is an, and, and then the nobility linked to social position and virtue regains strength because in fact it was always there. No need to say that the aim of the author of the Kitab al-Mujadala is opposed to that of Cartagena and that he obviously does not participate at all in the idea of a selective genealogical continuity that the latent nobility brings with it. For him, the theological corruption and the moral degeneration of the Jews are incontestable facts. These points are elaborated to a greater extent in the Tayyid, but the notion of this rupture between generations seems to be particular to the Kitab al-Mujadala, which I repeat was produced in this very close environment of the um, king. The, gener the generational break strengthens even more the perception that Jews are punished by God time and again, notwithstanding the fact that each new generation has the possibility to take the right path. And without doubt, uh, from a Muslim perspective, this is Islam. And, je and yet, the Jews relapse as sinners and repeat their story of error, disobedience, and offense against God because they are stubborn and rebellious. This is the main reasons, reason why Jews are condemned by God and not bloodline. I would argue that the Muslims' interest in dispute about this issue and about Abraham's offspring is not only due to theological reasons, but is also driven by the aim to advance upward mobility within the majority society, an aim that we have seen Cartagena also pursues in his defense of the conversions, of the conversals. The question, however, remains as of why a Muslim would raise the issue of predestination in the way this author does. That is, uh, by giving arguments against the transmission of uh, sin through blood that, of course, were of use for Muslims, but that also could be eventually be used by Jews in their own benefit to promote their own social ascension. Turning the question around, why would Jews have any interest in presenting themselves as supporters of <coughs> predestinarian views if, after all, mainstream Judaism understands ju uh, sin in other terms than this Muslim does? And moreover, Muslims are the ones who are often accused of such things. <coughs> Where is actually the polemics here? Having reached this point, I would like to make a brief digression on the question raised at the beginning of the presentation about Muslim understandings of Jewish identity and exceptionalism in the peninsula, which is an issue that is key to our working group. My impression is that the claims about personal responsibility in sin are not properly a Jew's attack <coughs> on Islam, but a Muslim refutation of the Christian's arguments against Islam redirecting redirected towards the Jews, something that recalls the notion of mim mimic rivalry proposed by René Girard, uh, and by which the Jew becomes an scapegoat. The views on Jews and Judaism of Muslims from the Christian territories are very diverse, but in general, the polemicists show a strong will to draw the image of the Jew as a sinner that has lost, lost God's favor something that is in line with Muslim tradition, but also with the Christian discourses of the time. No doubt, the ideas about offspring and lineage are important, and moreover, they are explicitly, explicitly mentioned in the Tayyid. So we read, for example, that the Jews, I quote, um, are of the like of the nature of Sodom and from the shoot of Gomorrah, unquote. Now, these same authors go on tiptoe over the question of blood, which is implicit in many of these claims. It is not elaborated, and when this occurs, distance is taken from deterministic views. From a Muslim perspective, Jews cannot boast of the nobility they got from their ancestors because their ancestors are sinners. Neither does genealogy help them to avoid individual and collective responsibility in their present actions. Such a discourse shifts the focus from, from blood to virtue. 
uh, that we have seen is encapsulated in the approach to nobility discussed discuss so far, and seem, seems to fit very well with the dominant discourses of the society's elites. Remember that regardless of the audience of these polemics, the Muslim authors belong to the community's elites. From the end of the 14th century, but with greater intensity during the 15th century, personal merit was key to social mobility, and this is the period in which the Muslim production of anti-Jewish polemics reaches its peak. So far, I haven't been able to find explicit references that distinguish the Jews from the territories from Jews from other places. The claim of a distinctive origin of Iberian Jews without detriment of having been meaningful within their communities, seems to have went unnoticed by Muslim outsiders and clearly did not become a topic of religious polemics. The reasons, the reasons for this could have been varied and probably were varied, but I would like to point at one that in my opinion might have been relevant, namely that unlike in Al-Andalus where Muslims were in a position of power, or in the converse of Christian collaboration in the Christian territories aimed at explaining the Bible, an endeavor in which uh, Muslims did not take part, at the time when there was still competition between the two religious minorities, arguments about origins were likely a delicate question, a weapon of double edge that could be turned against them in a majority context that discriminated Jews and Muslims by taking recourse to similar claims. So thank you very much. So a third paper and a very intense session. I'm glad to see that everyone is still uh, awake. I hope you will be so in, 30, in about half an hour. Um, I'd like to start by thanking uh, Ryan and uh, Mr. Frankel and uh, the Frankel uh, Center for uh, inviting me. It's a great pleasure to be able to take a couple of days away from what has now become a norm for me, administrative uh, a lot of administrative uh, uh, duties, and um, sadly, I think this will probably be my last academic conference for quite some time, so it's actually uh, uh, quite nice to be able to um, give a paper which is really, as you will see, work in progress, and playing with ideas, and I hope that I haven't made too much of too little, but I'll be uh, delighted uh, to hear what you have to say uh, after this. So. In his remarks at a session dedicated to Prophet Duran, the Efodi, at the last World Congress for Jewish Studies, Ram Ben Shalom suggested that in the wake of 1391 and the decrees, the decrees of 1412 and the Tortosa Disputation, which occasioned the conversion to Christianity of some of the leading lights of Catalan Judaism, there developed an internal Jewish discourse regarding these converts. This discourse disting distinguished between those who were referred to as innocent, pure conversos, and those sons of Blial, scoundrels or base men. The difference between the two categories was how they related with their previous faith. The first outwardly lived Christian lives, but internally, though they might, longer, though they might no longer observe the commandments, continued spiritually to be Jews, and in contrast, the latter denied their Judaism on all levels and embraced their new faith, some rising to eminent positions in the church. The pure conversos could be reconciled and supported by their Jewish contemporaries. The sons of Blial, obviously, were to be cast out and damned as apostates. Ramben Shalom's intriguing idea builds on Maud Kozadoy's recent study of Isaac ben Moses Halevi, better known as Prophet Duran, where she describes him as one living a, and I, I quote, a double life with its radical disjuncture between external conduct and internal orientation, or between an externally constructed and an internally determined identity, end quote. Ram posits that this construct worked not just for someone like Prophet Duran, 
but for many of the first generation of converts who tried to come to terms with their baptism, which externally identified them as Christians and their inner Jewish beliefs. Indeed, the study of the phenomenon of conversion suggests that converts never really leave their past behind them, and it very much informs their new religious identity, consciously or unconsciously. Hence, it is for very good reason that converts can be seen as important agents in the transfer of knowledge between religions and cultures. Here, I would like to build on Ram's idea and suggest that he has put his finger on something which is broader than the particular Jewish context he focused his remarks on. I think that something else is going on here, which I'm not yet sure how to explain, and perhaps reflects an existential crisis of sorts focused around religious identity, identity, the reasons for which are, at present, not entirely clear to me. What we seem to have here is the ability of an individual to have a split religious identity, to live comfortably in two worlds, to distinguish between the, private, the public sphere and private space, external demeanor and practices, and individual conscience and beliefs. This marks a significant change from the medieval world, where the two are almost indistinguishable, at least in the way we read our source materials. Why is this happening at this particular juncture in time? After 1391, religious dissimulation becomes more common, especially for those who to all intents and purposes had converted to Christianity, but continued in private to live as Jews. Indeed, the establishment of the Inquisition in Spain in 1478 was a result of the fear of what has been referred to as a submerged continent, thousands of new Christians who were not true believers. Yet this phenomenon is not just a Jewish one. Interestingly, around the same time that Prophet Duran was living externally as a Christian but internally as a Jew, other figures, literary or real, from the same intellectual and geographical milieu exhibited similar tendencies. Here I would like to focus on th briefly on three examples. One is the aforementioned Prophet Duran, and in this context, also a translation of the Gospels into Hebrew. The second is a literary example taken from the prologue of a Jewish polemical work where a high-ranking Christian is living life as a secret Jew. And the third, the story of Ansem Turmeda, though in the Christian-Muslim ambit, will bring us back to Prophet Duran. We should perhaps quickly recap what is known about Prophet Duran's biography. Born in Perpignan, part of the Crown of Aragon in the 1350s, he was, a well he was well educated in the fields of astronomy, philosophy and mathematics, and he became a physician as well as a moneylender. Following his conversion in 1391, where he took the name Honoratus, Prophet continues to be involved with the Jewish community. In 1393, he wrote a eulogy from, for Abraham ben Isaac Halevi of Girona, and in the following years, he wrote anti-Christian polemical works, such as Klimata Goyim, at the request of Chastai Kreskas, one of the leading Jewish figures of the period. In 1392, he was appointed astrologer to Juan I, King of Aragon, and was given the title Magister in Medicina. He writes Cheshev Haifod in 1395 on the Jewish calendar, and Maase Ephod in 1403, a grammatical work, using the pseudonym Ephod or, or Haephodi, by which he would become known. Prophet worked as a royal physician in Navarre, and he seems to have had some involvement in solving the two-year interregnum in 1412 in favor of Fernando I of Trastamare. He spent time in Italy and Valencia, where he died in 1433. Prophet was accorded great respect by leading Jewish contemporaries, such as Chastai Crescas, for whom Prophet penned his Klimata Goyim, Reproach of the Gentiles, which was then used by Crescas in his own anti-Christian polemic. It has been suggested that at some stage, Prophet Duran returned to Judaism. In his cultural milieu, this act would have been punishable by death and it would have been impossible for him to be the court astrologer and hold high position in the Christian court. So we have a dilemma. We have the dilemma of Honoratus, the converted Jew, who to all intents and purposes lived a Christian life, and his alter ego, the Ephodi, who writes Hebrew anti-Christian anti tracts and letters such as Altihika Avotecha, be, be not like your uh, ancestor, ancestors, to other, obviously, more sincere converts to Christianity. When David Bonnet Bonjon, the addressee of the latter tract, converts 
at the behest of Pablo de Santa Maria, a.k.a. Solomon Halevi, who's been mentioned here already, and seems to embrace Christianity wholeheartedly, it makes Prophet Duran's case all the more puzzling, as he was not denounced, nor, from what we can gather from the sources, did he feel that he was in any particular danger. One could add that the aforementioned Pablo, Bishop of Burgos, and Prophet Duran moved in the same social circles at the court and used each other's works. And while the former should be viewed as a ben belial, it was clearly not viewed as a hindrance to the latter. This could be explained by the simple fact that the Christian world was not yet fully adjusted to or ready to deal with the new reality of thousands of converts who had not, and had not yet developed the mechanisms for, tr for patrolling the boundaries between the faiths. This explanation might hold true for the first and second generation converts who lived in a manner which was unlikely to bring them to the attention of the Christian authorities. But here we're talking about someone who was very much in the public eye, though he did try to protect himself by writing under a pseudonym. Yet this duality of being is still hard to explain. Which brings me to the first complete translation of all four Gospels into Hebrew, carried out around this time in Catalonia. It is extant in a manuscript from Crete in the mid-15th century, now in the Vatican, and is a copy of the original translation. Sadly, there is no way of telling who the translator was, but a close philological study and comparison with two 14th century translations of the Bible from Latin into Catalan shows that the Hebrew translation was based on the Catalan. In other words, Whoever made the translation was clearly more conversant with Catalan than with Latin. The Hebrew is not of a high quality, and there are a lot of strange usages, such as Hakadosh Ruach, a very literal translation for Spiritus Sanctus, instead of the usual Hebrew expression Ruach HaKodesh. Strange also is the choice of the translator to quote verses from the Bible literally from the Catalan, rather than cite them directly from the Hebrew original. It is pretty clear that the historical context for the translation is the same which brought about the conversion of Prophet Duran, or perhaps the aftermath of the Tortosa disputation. But what is fascinating about the translation is its relative neutrality, or lack of polemical stance, stance, either Christian or Jewish. In other words, whether the translator was a Jew or convert to Christianity, he did not use the act of translation to project either a pro-Jewish or anti-Christian position. One only has to look at Prophet Duran's polemics against Christianity to see how easy it would have been to slant the translation in an anti-Christian fashion. Or look at the aforementioned Pablo de Santa Maria's Scrutinium Scripturarum to see how the translation could reflect anti-Jewish sentiments. The translator does neither. He translates the verbo ad verbum. There is only one place in the whole translation where there is an insertion which adds something that is not found in the original, and even there it could be interpreted neutrally, in that it just states that Christians make the sign of the cross before eating. In earlier studies of this translation, I struggled with the question of the religious identity of the translator. The quality of the Hebrew and the, lingu and the linguistic choices made by the translator suggested that perhaps he was a Christian who had studied Hebrew and decided to make the Gospels available for new converts so they would know something about their new faith. Yet, other characteristics of the, translations, of the translation suggested that the translator must have been of Jewish origin. For instance, the use of the term Shtiva Erev, the internal Jewish code word referring to the cross. However, it now seems to me that the same historical reality which allowed someone like Prophet Duran to flourish might provide the backdrop for this translation as well. This was a translation to be used by Jew or New Christian at a moment in time where they mixed relatively freely and the boundaries between the faiths, the faiths were less stringent and not well policed. It could very well be that the translator was someone who had converted to Christianity and lived outwardly as a Christian but internally still saw himself as Jewish. It is interesting to note that though the translation was copied at least once, no trace of its influence is to be found in later works, and it seems to have been ignored. This could imply that for later generations, its neutrality was its downfall, and, and it was not fitting, usable, or useful for any other historical moment or context. 
The possibility of being able to live a double life is also found in the prologue to a little-known polemical work entitled Hoda'at Baal Din, Admission of Guilt, composed by one Don David, supposedly in Crete in 1430. There are some eight extant manuscripts of this little book, and it was printed twice, in the late 19th and again at the start of the 20th century. The similarity to the aforementioned Prophet Duran's Klimata Goyim has been pointed out. However, the methodology adopted is unusual, in that the truth of the 13 Maimonidean principles of faith presented in the work are illustrated by using the New Testament itself as the proof text. The prologue provides a fascinating backdrop to the work, in that we meet a cardinal who lives a remarkable secret life. The following is, the, is a translation. From my youth till the present, I was a loyal member of the household of the highly esteemed Cardinal Francisco Bentivoglio, who was to me like a father. For I found favour in his eyes, and I desired to be in his shadow. And there I sat on this island which gives pleasure to anyone who, see it, who sees it, Candia, and its air is as pure as its name. In former times it was called Crete, or the island of good fort fortune, Isola Fortuna. My job was to run his financial affairs. I ate his bread and drank his water, and I did not eat of his non-kosher meat, nor drink his wine. And so that I should be close to him all the time, this man of generosity advised, purchased, and gave me a field and vineyard in his immediate vicinity. From its fruits I ate, and from its goodness I was sated. And morning, afternoon, and evening, I blessed he who had given me so much. And I studied Torah daily in my free time, not missing one day, even if I studied for a short period. And the rest of the day, <clears throat> I, I accompanied his eminence wherever he turned. And I gave him good advice. I taught him wisdom, knowledge, and understanding of the holy language, for his soul desired it. And it was after many days when the wisdom he had acquired burst forth, and his heart perceived the wisdom in the investigation of philosophical matters. His eyes lit up, and he saw the difference of the light, this light, the pure Torah of the Lord. And darkness covered the land of his birth, a new law of idolatry, not the real Torah. And he asked of me to reveal to him in great secrecy the mistakes of the fools, their, missionary, their miseries of their imaginary Messiah, the hunter of the souls of the blind and the lame. And when I knew the man and his conversation, and that his spirit was true, I opened the books of faith for my patron, Sefer Klima, Reproach of the Gentile, Machazik Emuna, Defender of Faith, and Ezeha Emuna, the Support of Faith, and others like them. And I laid out their words like a dress, and he rejoiced in them. And when I finished speaking, he admitted the truth and cursed his destiny, which forced him to live in his previous faith because of those around him. And in order to give him some pleasure, I wrote this new treatise, the likes of which has never been seen. And I called it Hoda'at Baldin, for the twelve apostles' mouths afflicted them, and against their better judgment, their hands, which wrote the Gospels, revealed the truth of our thirteen principles of faith. And it is simple logic, witnessed from within the Gospels, in passing, that their nine articles of faith are supported by falsehoods. And this is the attribute of truth, that it bears witness for itself. And he, in other words the Cardinal, saw it was good, and put it in his bosom, and genuinely continued to love me. And I kept this copy in secret for me and my descendants forever. According to this prologue, the author is to be found in Crete, where he has the patronage of a cardinal, Chashman, with whom he is on very good terms. He has the run of the estate, and is even given land by the cardinal in the immediate vicinity of the house. The intimacy between the two leads to discussion about faith, and the cardinal comes to realize the falsehood of Christianity and the truth of Judaism. The Cardinal then seems to have led a secret life as a Jew, while outwardly continuing to lead the life of a Prince of the Church. This is the supposed backdrop for the writing of this book, which is to show the Cardinal how the 13 articles of the Jewish faith can be ascertained from within the Christian authoritative texts, and the nine Christian articles of faith dismissed as lies, using the same text. It is very unlikely that there is any concrete historical reality to this story. The author disguises his true identity in the same way that he invents a cardinal whose name suggests that he is from Italy. He also sets the story in Crete, a very clever ploy given that the Venetians ruled the island and, and Catalan merchants were a constant presence there. Yet, 
The reality described in the work, along with the works mentioned in the prologue, including that of Prophet Duan, suggests that the book was written in dialogue with the realities of early 15th century Spain. It perhaps refers to the ambiguities felt even by senior churchmen caught up in the international offence of portent, such as the Great Schism, and more local matters such as the mass conversions from Judaism to Christianity and the Tortosa Disputation. If a converted Jew could actually become a bishop, it was not beyond all realms of possibility for the author of this work that a bishop could live a secret life as a Jew. And even if this is far-fetched, the work clearly reflects the fears and problems facing the first generation of converts, reversing in a way the situation that many conversos found themselves in. Though not wishing to push this further than is desirable, the anonymous author, who uses a nom, a nom de plume with messianic connotations, may indeed have someone like Pablo de Santa Maria or his son Alonso de Cartagena in mind, a first-generation convert from a distinguished Jewish line who rises to great heights in the, Christ, in the church hierarchy, becoming Bishop of Burgos, who, though he wrote anti-Jewish tracts, still uses his Jewish hermeneutical skills to interpret the biblical text in a Christian manner. The story told in the prologue of Hodat Baldin is to some extent mirrored in a negative way by a mid-15th century anonymous satirical work which emerges from the courtly culture of Castile. In the form of a royal privilege, King John II allowed a noble named Juan, Cristianos Viejos Lindos, as he's described in the work, to convert to being a converso and to act like one. In this work, it is clear that converso identity is equated with being Jewish, as Juan acts in a manner expected of a Jew. He oppresses Christians, behaves lawlessly, charges interest, he becomes a priest in order to divulge the secrets he hears in the confession, eats Jewish dishes, and gives bad advice to Christians, amongst many other things. In other words, with the king's blessing, a Christian noble converts to Judaism so as to achieve his aims. This anonymous satire reflects the concern with loss of clear-cut religious and cultural identities, which was clearly a concern for the author. This seemingly easy crossing of religious boundaries could bring about subversion from within, and this text reflects the uneasiness which I think would soon result in the setting up of the Inquisition. The examples so far have come from within the Jewish-Christian ambit. For my final example, we turn to the Christian-Muslim encounter again in the broader Iberian context. Anselm Turmada was born a Christian on the island of Mallorca, a part of the crown of Aragon around the year 1352, and converted to Islam in Tunis around the year 1387 when he was 35. We know this because in 1421, Anselm, who after his conversion to Islam took the name Abdallah, wrote a polemical work in Arabic against his former religion, which he called the gift of the learned one for the refutation of the people of the cross. Well, at least I'm going to, for the purposes of this paper, we'll take it for granted that he did write the work as we, as we have it. I'm looking at Ryan because uh, he's, the res he's the resident expert. In the first part of this work, written 33 years after his conversion, Anselm, or Abdallah, told the story of why he, tried to, why he decided to convert to Islam. Any story told years after the event it relates tends, as we know, to emphasize certain things and ignore others, and the story as told by Anselm is no different. However, it is significant because the author decided that in a work where he polemicizes against Christianity, he had to establish his credentials as a believing Muslim knowledgeable about Christianity. Though Anselm decided what personal details to omit in his story, other documents from this period relating to him provide us with slightly more information. When put together with the story he tells, the following general outline emerges. Born into an important Mallorcan family, Anselm began his formal education when he was six, studying the Gospels and logic with the priest. At the age of 10, he was sent to Lieda on the mainland, where for six years he studied natural sciences and astronomy. Following this, age 16, he arrived in Bologna, a university town where he studied theology, with one friar Nicolao Martello, otherwise unknown to us, but described by Anselm as being old, very knowledgeable, pious, and austere. And following his master, he joined the Franciscan order. The relationship which developed between master and student turned out to be decisive in the conversion process. As Anselm's knowledge increased, so did the intimacy he had with Nicolao, 
who gave him the keys to all the rooms in his house except for one room where he would retire by himself. Anselm suggests that this locked and secret room is where Nicolaus stores his earthly treasures and gifts. It turns out, however, that this wise old Christian priest had come to the realization that the paraclete talked about by Jesus according to the Gospel of John was none other than Muhammad. Hence, Nicolau reveals to Anselm his innermost secret, that the truth of Islam represents the truth, re represents the peak of Christian belief. And we then understand that the secret room is the only place where Nicolau can live his hidden religious identity without fear of being discovered. This shocking revelation by Nicolau, who though acknowledging the truth of Islam, was unwilling to convert himself because of his standing in the Christian world, his age, and lack of knowledge of Arabic, was what caused Anselm to leave Bologna and make his way to Tunis. Having spent four months with the Christian community, in the presence of the Sultan, Abu al-Abbas, and after having his high standing confirmed by leading figures of the latter community, he publicly embraced Islam. Following his conversion, and having passed the test of his loyalty related to an attempt to persuade him to return to Christianity by a fellow Franciscan, Anselm, now called Abdallah, serves the Hafsid, Hafsid court as a mediator and translator between Muslims and Christians. It is worth remarking that there are fascinating similarities in how the stories are told in both Hoda'at Baal Din and The Gift of the Learned One, and the emphasis put on things not normally featured in polemical works. The detailed descriptions of locales, Candia in the first, Mallorca and Bologna in the second, with particular attention to fauna and the food. The construction of the narrative, which highlights how only when an extraordinary level of trust is established between the protagonists that the truth can be uh, uh, revealed, and it is a truth which shatters established and expected norms. What are we to make of Anselm's physical and spiritual journey from Mallorca to Tunis and spiritual transition from Christianity to Islam? And why is such a central role in the story given to Nicolau, respected Franciscan by appearance and practice, but actually a secret, a secret believer in the truth of Islam? Nicolau did not officially convert to Islam, but did so in his heart. One of the reasons given is fear of losing social status, the very thing that Anselm gains through his conversion, becoming a confidant of the Sultan instead of a lowly friar minor. Yet for someone who decided to convert and leave his Christian identity behind, Tunis was a strange place to choose to live. For more than a century, there had been close political, military and economic ties between the rulers of the crown of Aragon and the rulers of Tunis. The presence of Catalan merchants in Tunis meant that Anselm would never really be able to severe his ties with his prior co-religionists nor with his cultural upbringing, and perhaps he did not really want to. The issues of religious identity are very present in the person of Anselm Abdallah, who, like the aforementioned Prophet Duran, continues, after his conversion, to write works in Catalan for a Christian audience. One of the most well-known of these works is called The Dispute of the Ass, composed in 1417-1418, which depicts a debate between a protagonist named Anselm and an ass, dealing with the question of whether humans are nobler than animals. What is surprising is that given his animosity to Christianity in the Arabic gift of the learned one, his Catalan works cite approvingly from the Gospels and encourage belief in the Trinity. This raises questions about the authenticity of Anselm's conversion to Islam and suggests that it may have more, pragma it have, it may have more pragmatic reasons to do with upward social mobility and economic outlook in the, in the court of the Hafsid rulers of Tunis. Indeed, in this context, the second part of the gift of the learned one, placed in between the conversion narrative and the attack on Christianity, is a panegyric to the Hafsid rulers he served. So what do we have here in Toto? It seems we have tales or examples of continuity and discontinuity, of religious assimilation which could be considered markers of a move from medieval to early modern religiosity. Obviously, both of the latter are artificial, artificial constructions in order to make it easier to talk about historical periods and are not easily delimited or defined. Yet the texts discussed here reveal changes in concept and understanding of religious identities which are new to our ears. 
I might be making too, too much of too little with regard to the sources, but I am sure that with more time, I could have come up with many more interesting examples. Perhaps these lone voices, shouting out or rebelling against the religious norms of their cultures, of societies, questioning or challenging the boundaries between faiths, are harbingers of, of the much more significant calls for reform and renewal of the 16th century. Question mark. Sorry, there's a question mark there. That wasn't meant supposed to be a full stop. I would like to end with reference to a 19th century figure, Rabbi Elijah Tzvi Soloveitchik, a.k.a. Elias Soloveitchik, who lived from 1805 to 1881, the grandson of Rabbi Chaim of, of Volodin, who, though an Orthodox Jew, wrote a commentary in Hebrew on the Gospels, entitled Kol Kore, in a manner of speaking, a polemic against both Jews and Christians. This work was first published in French, English, German, and Polish translations before, the, before being published in the original Hebrew version in 1879-1880. On the title page, he writes that, and I quote, with an interpretation to show everyone that the New Testament only comes to show that the root of existence is in the unity of God, Achdut Habore, and also to strengthen the law of Moses, Torah Moshe, end of quote. It seems that he wanted to educate his Jewish readers about their misunderstanding of Christianity. In the introduction, he compares himself to the high priest in the temple about to start the complicated rituals of Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement. He continues, I quote, I know that I will not escape suspicion from both sides. My Jewish brothers will say, what has come over Rabbi Eliyahu? Just yesterday he was like any other Jew, and now he is possessed by another spirit. And my Christian brothers will say, here is one who comes to reveal the secrets of the New Testament and he is a Jew. How can there be truth on his lips and good intentions in his heart? These are two opposites in one person, and if he speaks with his lips, but in his, heart think, in his heart thinks differently? God knows and is my witness that I am innocent of any crime. With a pure heart and clean conscience, I have embarked on this project, for it is time to do for God's sake." End of quote. The dilemma presented here by this 19th century Jew, descendant of a leading rabbinical figure who chose, unlike many of, many of his contemporaries, not to convert to Christianity, yet still write about the Gospels and try and reconcile Jew and Christian, though different in temperament and context, is a fascinating reminder of the complexity of religious identities in a changing world. Thank you. Would you like us to remember? Yes. That? I think we have time for no, we have to four. ten minutes of questions. No, <laughs> twenty-two minutes of questions. <laughs> <laughs> is a serious problem, I think. Yeah. Um, the issue, what we have here is Abner Moret Sedek in Catalan. We don't have the Hebrew original, as I understand. So, so yeah. we have here a work that actually in Catalan and the readership is probably Christians. Hmm. And, and we don't know, and we don't have the original to compare and to, to know how faithful he is. To, to you know to his original how, how many changes he did or didn't be, uh, do but what we have in the, in this Catalan Moret Sedek is that he's speaking about about the, the Sadducees and, and, and Pharisees which are two parties that that the uh, Christian Christian re reader of the time is very familiar you know from you know from the gospel so mm. so I don't see here any any car rights. I see here a, a, um, a work that is, is intended for, for Christians, uh, readers, and are actually presenting the strife inside the Jews, the Jewish community, with, with uh, you know terms that are familiar for them. 
Okay. Uh, let's see here. So, first on the question of the language, Castilian, not Catalan. Um, but we do know something about the original, for a, you know, and we also know something about the relationship between the Castilian and the Hebrew of his works in general. We have Abner repeated himself quite a lot. So the same arguments appear from the Moed Tzedek in later works, Chuvat uh, La Mecharef, a work that exists in Hebrew. We have it in Hebrew, in a Hebrew manuscript, um, which actually belonged to Judah, Messer of Leon, and the Castilian version matching that, so we can compare them. So passages that he repeats, for example, in that later work that does survive in Hebrew, that also have a Castilian, the Castilian of that matching text also very much matches what's in the, the Moret Tzedek or the Mostrador in Spanish or in Castilian. So you see, we can we can find certain examples that directly show that the Castilian translations are matching very closely uh, when he repeats himself exactly the things that appear in Hebrew. So that's one piece showing connections between Castilian and Hebrew. Another is that one year before the Moed Tzedek, he wrote an, a smaller version of the same text called uh, The Wars of the Lord, Milhamot Adonai, in Hebrew. And we know he translated this uh, for Blanca, right? This work uh, doesn't survive in Castilian, but has been quoted in Latin. Those Latin passages uh, also show the same repetitions. So we have more examples that he's repeating himself and for those, again, it matches the Hebrew that we have in later works. Third, on the question of actually uh, written for Christians, this uh, is, there is evidence that the Castilian versions were used by Christians, clearly. They were asked for by Christians, patronized by Christians, and we know certain libraries where they survived. In fact, this very manuscript, we know where it was and how it got to us today. I can actually follow the manuscripts of all the Castilian works from the 14th century all the way through the libraries to today. So we know, and also the Hebrew. You can follow how the manuscripts traveled, so we know very much the provenance of these manuscripts and who used them along the way, or at least what libraries they were in, and who sort of, what prominent readers used them. Pablo de Santa Maria, we know, is one of them who had access to the Hebrew manuscripts, okay? So written for Christians is a problematic argument because the Castilian is not very good. It's not made in a way that is easy to read for a Christian. Partly because there are abbreviations uh, in how the rabbinical literature is referenced that make it obscure, uh, but that are clear to someone who's reading the original. Partly because uh, the Castilian actually makes mistakes in, in the way it's rendered, um, making his argument not work very well as a Christian argument. And it has to do with translation more than it has to do with uh, anything else. And so it's, doesn't, it's not clear that this work could have been used by a Christian who didn't know Hebrew and especially rabbinical literature. It's very, they're very, very clumsy and very bad uh, in that sense. Um, they're, even today, like you read them and they're, they're, they're rambling and they're incomprehensible unless you have some sense of rabbinical literature behind them. Um, so I don't think these works were written for Christians. There's one candidate for a work that was written for a Christian audience, uh, which is in the same manuscript as the Castilian version. And that clearly seems to, it's much more ordered and scholastic. It has uh, a totally different profile. And uh, so I think that it's problematic to think he was writing for Christians, uh, certainly these manuscripts. But at the same time, uh, what you were saying about uh, telling this story of Karaites, Sadducees, and Pharisees, there's another section of the Moritz Tzedek, in, in fact I, I referenced it, where he gives the 41 or 42 different sects and divisions. And in that he talks about there are certain Jews who deny their Talmud, and there are other Jews who deny part of the Talmud, and then there are other Jews who do this, and there are other Jews who do that. And so he defines who he's talking about. And we. Uh, He's thinking of it in specific terms that have to do with Jewish categories, not with uh, Christian categories of who the Sadducees and Pharisees are. They don't match biblical, historical 
names. In fact, it has to do with these other discussions of the certain types of Jews who deny their Talmud in part or in whole, others who don't believe in, in the soul after death, others who do this, others who do that. And so he is specifically defining who the Sadducees and Pharisees are. Uh, and it matches the way Ibn Dawood talks about them, um, not the way they are in the Bible. Um, because they're part of the Christian her uh, or the Jewish heretical cluster that he's defining. Um, so we actually have that. And we also have matching parallels where he talks about uh, how the, the burning of the Talmud in Paris in the 1240s, he tells that in the context of certain groups, and he doesn't use the same terms. He says, then there are other Jews who deny their Talmud, but they're not Sadducees or Pharisees. And they went to the Christians and had them burn the Talmud in Paris. You know, he's talking about Nicholas Donin and the stories of, uh, of burning the Talmud. And so he's very specific about who these groups are. So even maybe I didn't give all of the background enough to know, but I don't agree with the, the idea that these translations are, for, for, are made for Christians. They're hard to use for a Christian, for sure. We have information about what actually the Hebrew is, quite a lot, to the extent that we can read backwards. In fact, Yitzhak Ber translated some of it back into Hebrew, or tried to. Um, maybe that's questionable, but we, you know, <laughs> someone who's reading into it can, uh, you can see what his outlook is, and it's not made for a Christian readership. Um, and then third, we have information about how they were used. And fourth, we have information about how Pharisees and Sadducees are defined from a particular point of view that has to do with accepting oral Torah or not. So. That's my, uh, I'm not sure if that answers all of those questions, but I think that it gets at your doubts. So. Are yeah, the sections on forced conversion the ones that repeat themselves? Uh, no. So this is not something that appears anywhere else at all. Uh, That's an intriguing. Which is really interesting, yeah. yeah. And nor is the reference to so-called, as you pointed out, and I think you're right in doubting this, the reference to Moses of Leon. Attributing this to Moses of Leon, it's really exciting because it's Moses of Leon, you know. Could it be the author of the Zohar? We don't have any other reference. But this is something we should and could doubt, at least. We don't have any reason to really believe him, that it even that there was a letter, or let alone that uh, um, he's quoting from it or saw it. It could be completely a made-up authority. Who knows? Is there Louis the King of France? <laughs> and you remember that? Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. We have some hands. Uh, Moshe? Thank, thank you very much for all of you. I have a question for, for Chaim. First of all, for the last quote from Chaim, from, from Chaim, so basically. From so basically. Uh, <laughs> Not Chaim. <high>. Yeah. <laughs> um, you said uh, it's time to do, uh, like the last word, time to do for God's sake, you said. Yeah. And the Hebrew is et lasat Hashem, I guess. Yeah. So et lasat Hashem, et ferru tabatecha, the, the, mm -hmm. the perfect excuse for to tra transgression. And I wanted to compare it to, I mean, not compare it, give it an, an interesting case of a mid-14th century uh, Jewish convert to Islam in, in Damascus, Moshe ben Shmuel. We have a few extant uh, autobiographies, I mean, makamas that he wrote here about his autobiography, where he tells how he was forced, uh, you know, coerced to convert to Islam um, by his emir. And he didn't want to, and he regretted it, and he wanted to come back, but then he was promoted, and then he said to his family, no, now I'm, you know, after this Hajj to Mecca, now I'm done with Islam, but then he was promoted, and, <laughs> and, he, nev and he never says that he went back to Judaism, because for him, he was always Jewish, right? But he, and this is all written in Hebrew, and all preserved and copied, and in the Egyptian tradition, uh, tradition of Egyptian Jews, and including liturgical hymns for use in the cinema, mm. copied until the late 19th century. So perhaps he's also another good example, and, and not too far away chronologically, for a person who felt, I don't know if he felt equally comfortable, maybe equally uncomfortable in both, <laughs> both places. Thank you. That's uh, Mike. Um, I have a question slash comment for Ryan. Uh, obviously, this connection to the Abner of Burgos in 1391 has always, you know, it's been into very intriguing to me for a long time. Um, I'm pretty convinced by your arguments that Abner himself did not approve of forced conversion. So uh, Yitzhak Baer clearly overstates his case that Abner somehow, if not caused 1391, but there is like a 
direct line to the foreground. However, there might be some connection that I'd like to ask you about. This um, Abner convincing Alfonso the 11th to ban Birkat Kaminim, the Birkat Kaminim prayer. And it is, uh, I think it's pretty well known fact that Ferran Martinez, who I'm studying in Seville, um, he stated, well, he, one of his main, one of his main points in his propaganda against the synagogues was that synagogues were, were a place where, um, well, they were houses of Satan, where the Christian people and the king were cursed three times a day, mm -hmm. which historians understand as a reference to this Birkat Kaminim prayer, mm -hmm. which is part of the Amida, as I understand that. So uh, what do you make of that? Um, is there some sort of, I mean, other accusations uh, against the prayer before Abner Ab 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 So that's basically the first one to kind of put that into circulation. Mm -hmm. And if so, do you think there's a connection between Abner and what Ferran Martinez is saying probably in the 1380s or so? It's a good question. Um, as far as earlier uh, complaints, there definitely are. So the ones, the people involved in the burning of the Talmud, uh, Nicholas Donin brings among his complaints against the Talmud, or at least people in that manuscript circle mention the Birkat Haminim or some reference to cursing of the Christians in their prayer. So I think that was, that's the earliest I know of. I don't know if you know of an earlier reference to it, but the idea that, that Christians are being cursed in Jewish prayers seems to come out in the 13th century. Yeah. Um, and Ramon Marti also makes reference to it. Um, so it did exist. But then again, the idea that Fernand Martinez uses it is compelling because those works w didn't necessarily circulate in the world where Fernand Martinez circulated, whereas Abner is Castilian. And so Certainly his arguments could have trickled down, especially because Alfonso XI had a policy that would have applied to Seville just as well as anywhere else. So that's a, a good connection as far as if you are drawing, making connections and connecting dots. Um, it doesn't have to be Abner directly, but Abner could be a piece of this chain. Um, certainly not an initiator, but uh, that decree by Alfonso XI, which there's no evidence that it was actually put into practice or not. No one really knows. but. That could be a source of information for Fernand Martinez, sure, um, in that sense. I'm actually interested in more like that, too. If I could think of more examples of, of what Fernand Martinez actually says and who he's reading, I want to actually know more about where he's getting his ideas. Because um, it's certainly plausible that he's drawing from Abner, or if not from Abner, but from Abner's followers, I would say. Um, but. Drawing the connection, I think that there's a, 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 a break and that Abner isn't certainly the initiator of those ideas. I'd like to know more, though. think about other ways. Mark and then, and then Ross. I have, I have two questions, one for Monica and then one for all three speakers. Monica, I really enjoyed your paper and I have to read your book. I'm sorry I haven't here. But, um, Me too. You talk about competition between what we might call Yudekar and Jewish courtiers hmm. or position. And yet, if we look at the Crown of Aragon in particular, the playing field wasn't exactly level because there were far more, you know, elite Jews. Yes. And it's been suggested, I think maybe first by John Boswell years ago, that um, you know some of these texts written by Mudéjars were actually more, you know, apologetic because there were Mudéjars who were converting uh, to Judaism. Because I think letters were written by Mudéjar leaders. I think in the 1350s to Perry the Ceremonious, mm -hmm. you know, complaining about this problem and asking the king to, uh, to do something about it, and I think he, mm -hmm. of course, uh, forbade it. So I'm just kind of wondering if you see, you know, apologetics being, you know, part of this and not just social, you know, competition. Yeah, thanks for the question. I, I mean, of course, I, I like this. Um, you are totally right. Um, but my impression is that indeed there were these conversions, but we also have, and we can see in some materials, um, I have been working lately in 
materials connect to these polemics, which um, in which you can find the very rare but quite interesting phenomenon of Hebrew written in Arabic characters, um, and where you have the Bidui, the Seder Olam, and other uh, materials that probably are connected to the disputation of Tortosa. Uh, uh, so, <laughs> um, and, and these are placed together with uh, one of these polemics that tie it. Um, and seem to suggest that there were also Jewish conversions to Islam. I did not touch upon the, the issue because, um, um, well, when I start to look at this uh, topic of exceptionalism, to me it's quite new to look at it from the perspective of nobility and in a broader um, perspective. And, um, and I also did not touch on other issues because, for example, the other day, uh, David Nirenberg was talking about, um, he, ha he uh, has the idea that the work of Cartagena could have been the model of uh, a Muslim work written in the 18th century in Fez by Al-Zikri, uh, in which there is this, um, um, uh, <coughs> trying to um, uh, defend the, the, um, the non-Sharifi Muslims. And I really do not know if, the, if such, a, such a model, so if Cartagena was the model of a secret, but w what I wonder is in how far, for example, someone like Cartagena, I mean, how spread were these ideas mm -hmm. about uh, nobility not only um, uh, a real one because none of the, no, none of the two groups were novels in fact within the Christian society as far as I could find they did not get uh, novel titles although a number of, there were a number of conversio, conversio courtiers were making those when they converted words. to Christianity right, right, but not right. before right. so uh, there is indeed this inequality but at the same time time, th there is also the possibility of going upwards and um, and uh, and you have, for example, uh, this source of this polemic who uh, was likely this physician of the king. So he was probably close to other Jewish physicians, but I do not have the evidence. I mean, the, the evidence I, I'm working with, it's uh, very much spread on on on, on the various sources, but um, it seems to me that that there were also these conversions from Judaism to to Islam, and not only the other the other way around. But of course, as also Nuremberg has claimed, I think he said before 14, 14 uh, 14, the other 15th century, it was more from uh, Islam to Judaism and then the other way around. So, yeah. Thank you. You're welcome. Yeah, and just my more general question. You know, we have all these fascinating cases of these converts, polemicizers, people kind of sort of between identities. Uh, and, and, you know, it, it's, it's incredible material. Um, and yet, you know, we have the work of you know, someone like Paul Tartikoff, you know, who, who shows that while well, most, you know, Jewish converts, you know, they converted not for intellectual or theological reasons, but for all kinds of, you know, social and political and economic sorts of reasons. And there were very many of them. Right. <laughs> there were very many of them. Okay. Yeah. Hmm. And, and almost every Mudekar I run across in the Kingdom of Valencia, I mean, I'm, I, I work with, you know, artisans and so forth, so, you know, I'm a social historian. Almost no one is converting because they've been persuaded by, you know, for <laughs> theological reasons. There, there, yeah, every mood they are convert, I, I, I run across practically is hanging out in a tavern or, or, is, or is, you know, attempt, you know, working with prostitutes from various phases and, and yeah, this yeah. kind of thing. <laughs> so, I guess more dealing with these issues of, identity in border crossing and so forth. You know, how do we, I guess, bridge this gap, or, or can we, between the experience of these intellectuals and we might say, you know, the rank and file, you know, converts, or, I don't know if that's really a question, but it's just an observation, perhaps. Thoughts? 
we have we have less than a minute. <laughs> Go. I, I think I might I might just let us think. <laughs> Do you, yeah, Ryan always has Robert. Up, so. Just uh, not to overrule me. I won't be a, I won't be but half a minute. I only want to say that it could be a, almost a heuristic rule of thumb that converts are almost never mm, the ones we have are never convinced by arguments. They're converting for practical reasons. That's just like a standard rule of thumb that we should follow. It's all not of this true polemical in the 17th stuff. Century at all. <laughs> can really convince people later on. Yes, yeah, like later on I think that uh, <laughs> things are different, but in this moment the medieval oh, I'm getting a call from my mother. <laughs> <laughs> no, uh, just that all of this stuff, all this polemic it's fantasy that it's not uh, effective missionizing, and I don't think it works for missionizing. It doesn't actually convince people. It's, it's pastoral care, as uh, I think Robin Vos shows, or it's, it's self-therapy, or it's some other form of uh, uh, violence, but it's not actually mission, and it's not actually uh, rhetorically effective. So I think that there's some, basically these converts are, are head cases in a certain sense. They're people who are caught between thoughts and they're convincing themselves. But this material could be for lots of reasons as well, for proving their authenticity to their patron or trying to protect themselves. But uh, Abner's a weird case in that he tries to actually reach out to people, but he's still not effective. No one, I don't, I don't know anyone who's, a, who's actually convinced by any of these stories, at least except for a few random weirdos. So I think on the whole, the most of the converts, the real converts, are not converting for ideology, but for circumstance. Uh, whereas all the ideology produces very little you know, substance, but makes good reading. I, I'd go along with what uh, was just said to my right here, although I'd, I'd say that um, the amount of materials that we have, which are supposedly devoted to trying to convert people intellectually, Right. That does mean that people are thinking about this. Whether it, whether it, whether it uh, um, convinces whether it convinces them or not is uh, or convinces other people or not is is, is something different. But this but there's clearly uh, uh, something that means that they that that causes them to have to devote so much time and energy to thinking about. Uh, uh, and I'd actually agree with uh, um, with Ryan. I think the first real and here's where I, I think the first real person to real, in, in a sense, to, who, who really is thinking about conversion through and is writing in order to convert others is Avner. Mm -hmm. Alfonso de Valdolid, I think everything that goes on before that has nothing to do with conversion and much more to do with, much more to do with internal uh, Christian or Jewish uh, uh, circumstance. And I, there's also, let's just add one half word, which is, now we're way past one minute. <laughs> that, all of this argumentation, I, the reason it's so abundant, the reason polemics are this way, the reason people repeat themselves so much, is that conversion, especially to Christianity and Islam, is about an ideal. It's representing a theological narrative of supersessionism. Right. Mm -hmm. um, there are very few stories of conversion to Judaism that are elaborated as stories, and th this is because this doesn't represent th the fulfillment of any sort of ideal. Uh, so I think that it's an obsession because it represents a theological notion, which is being, re it's, it's a small version of history. It's really this is my by, yeah. oh, we could have a much longer conversation about that. But that's, uh, but, yeah. yeah. Ross, we have to right. sacrifice you. Oh, uh, no, we won't sacrifice you. Go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> dropping something I wanted to say to Ryan. I want to, really quick, to, to Lauren, I think the, the idea that Ryan brought up about the Jews and socioeconomic motivation um, is front and center. There, there, there might be something else going on. There's a very odd uh, Jewish uh, author, uh, Solomon uh, Ibn Abderet, in uh, Aragon in the later 13th century, mm -hmm. who writes a polemical treatise against, against Islam, and there's no Islamic context for it. And he's polemicizing against Ibn Hazm, who's been long dead mm -hmm. in a completely different world from so I'm wondering... You mean, you mean that there is a, 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 a tiny reference to Ibn Hazm? No, 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 no,
on the face of it, out with, if you just take mm -hmm. away the socioeconomic aspect, yeah. which is, I think, always really important, mm -hmm. it, it's very odd that two minorities would be polemicizing religiously against one another. If, if you just set aside the socioeconomic motivation for it, what, what is at stake? So it occurs to me that maybe th there's another element of psychosocial hierarchy mm -hmm. at play. Mm -hmm. Why two minorities, w w w you know, the, the threat isn't there really. I mean, it, conversion is available if you want it, but there, there's no, you're, you're not being assaulted by a, a majoritarian triumphalist statement in any direction from another minority. So what, what mm. brings people to want to engage in that polemic when your interlocutor really isn't there? It's an absent voice. Harvey wants the answer. Well, sometimes it's to, strength, to strengthen uh, uh, notions of authority within your own community. Yes. I, I think For that, example. I, I think that it's a, you have a straw person out there, I, I think is, is obvious. But I think there may also be some kind of hierarchy going on mm -hmm. that you share minority status, but you're at least, you know, you're at least more advanced than the other. I mean, look at you the mean the in salvation in the end of times, for example? Okay, look at Ryan, one of the passages that Ryan gave us, this really odd statement in Avner, where he's saying, essentially, you know, we Muslims and Moors, we've got to kind of cordon you off mm -hmm. from these, perf you know, the perfidy of the Jews. Mm -hmm. I mean, this is, a, this is it's an incredible argument because he doesn't care about the, about the Muslims. Um, he's preoccupied with whatever he think, whatever's going on between him and the Jews. But mm -hmm. this triangulation, I think, is, is another aspect mm -hmm. of it. Yeah, I totally agree. It as so, in a yeah. minority mm -hmm. situation. Anyway. Can I just say one yeah. small thing and then we'll <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I'm keeping people from their... From their uh, what, what I think what happens and why he write, why t talking about Solomon ibn Adret and why he writes uh, a treatise against Ibn Hazm right, is that through Ibn Hazm he actually is answering Ramon Malti right. well, because he, he's, he's in dialogue with Ramon Malti and Ibn Hazm is his straw man and he uses, right. he uses Ibn Hazm uh, or thinks through Ibn Hazm about how he can uh, um, right. answer well, Ramon Malti and Ramon Malti is described a similar dynamic right. mm -hmm. in fact uh, yeah. what we have run out of time, we will take a negative seven minute break and return to <laughs> <laughs> the keynote we have a large group. And what should, should we actually take a, uh, a break for three minutes? Um, mm -hmm. And just be 10 minutes yeah, behind schedule? Yeah. Yeah. So people can run to the bathroom and uh, yeah, okay. so, uh, so, uh, Let's take five minutes. <laughs> <laughs>